Good afternoon. What a pleasure to be back in person. This is our first in-person uh, talk in how long, Emma? Two years? So thank you. And I want to thank you all for wearing masks. We decided the speakers are not going to wear masks so you can actually understand what we're saying. Um, and actually, I passed a PCR test yesterday for a trip, so I'm safe for the, you know, at least through the, through the end of this talk, my talk. I'll put my mask back on. So I want to welcome you to the fifth annual State of Biodiversity um, Symposium, and, and we are absolutely thrilled to have you here with us for this important talk, and uh, whether you're joining us online or in the theater. So this is also not just our first in-person talk, it's our first hybrid. And uh, we will be celebrating 148 years of science at the museum this year. And with our region designated as one of 35 biodiversity hotspots in the world, our work to understand and preserve biodiversity is even more important than ever and growing in importance every single day. I don't know how many of you saw today's New York Times with the, with the article about uh, endangered biodiversity. And you look at San Diego area, and it is as red as, as the map gets. We want to give a huge thank you to the city of San Diego, to the museum's visitors, members, donors, and, and others whose generosity um, supports this work. But of course, we're not the only ones thinking about San Diego's biodiversity. In fact, today's audience contains many, many experts. We are honored by your presence as well and looking forward to the discussion. And we really uh, appreciate all the tremendous efforts everyone is, is doing toward these same goals. So thank you to all of you as well. We also want to offer our respect and gratitude to the indigenous peoples who are traditional stewards of the land. Specifically, we recognize the Kumeyaay people whose ancestral homelands the museum currently occupies and, uh, and, and who have lived on and cared for this land since time immemorial. As the original caretakers and conservationists, we honor their continued legacy and of caretaking and upholding the pillars of biodiversity. The museum is turning 148 this year, which is astounding for San Diego. And uh, we've been contributing to the conservation of the region this entire time. And uh, from helping preserve Torrey Pines um, and to setting aside Anza Borrego State Park to um, a number of other important efforts. And, oh, my new set is double-sided. <laughs> Uh, we also uh, did some instrumental work on the environmental impacts of DDT on, on pelican eggs, and uh, our work continues today with our researchers reestablishing red-legged frog populations. I saw some of our red-legged frog team. Raise your hands. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> These intrepid scientists have, uh, during the middle of a pandemic, uh, been able to translocate eggs from uh, ba Northern Baja California into, into Southern California, reestablishing a uh, population uh, that had gone locally extinct. So uh, congratulations and, and thank you for your work on that. Uh, we also have people actively assessing uh, movement of wildlife in the urban environment, developing community science projects to track native pollinators and, and many other things. But none of these projects happen in a vacuum, and we recognize that biodiversity is inextricably tied and linked with human systems. Of course, human systems are rife with inequities, so to truly understand and improve the future of our region's biodiversity, we must understand and improve the inequities. And this year's State of Diversity digs into just that. There is no one better to hear from on this topic than today's speaker, Dr. Chris Schell. Chris is, well, you can, yeah, let's applaud him twice. <laughs> he, Chris is an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy, and Management at UC Berkeley, where he studies the intersections of society, ecology, and evolution to understand how wildlife, mainly mammalian carnivores, are rapidly adapting to life in cities. 
The Shell Lab combines behavioral, psychological, and genomic approaches to demonstrate how historical and contemporary inequities influence the organismal biology and community dynamics of urban mammals. He's going to make that sound a lot more interesting in his talk, because this guy is a hell of a speaker. Um, in addition, Chris and the lab explore how this wildlife adaptation combined with human perceptions creates landscapes of risk that, that contribute to a human carnivore conflict. This interdisciplinary work requires integrating principles from the natural sciences with urban studies to address how systemic racism and oppression affect urban ecosystems while simultaneously highlighting the need to integrate environmental justice, civil rights, and equity as the bedrock of biological conservation and our fight against the climate crisis. So he works in this amazing space that brings together so many important topics and, uh, and is advancing the field in a really important way. He often works with underrepresented communities, wildlife managers, cultural institutions, and philanthropic organizations to help foster uh, mutually enriching uh, relationships among people and wildlife. So please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Chris Shell. What's up, y'all? How you doing? Everybody good? This is the first time we've been in person for two years? That's pretty dope. So I'm just going to say thank you all for allowing me to come chat with you about the research that we do in the lab. Thank you quite a bit for taking the time to listen to the ways in which we are connected to our wildlife, the ways in which we are connected to our cities. Today I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the work that we do and try and make that link, right? So Judy had introduced the topics and how those topics may seem pretty siloed, but they are all connected in very, very big ways. So the ways in which we're going to talk about those issues are through avatars like coyotes, like the ones that you see up here, because the behavior of these animals allows us to see the city in a different light, see it in a way that we may not be able to see it through a lens that may not be as easily adaptable to us. Right, which is part of the reason why I call this talk Legacies, Luxury, and Prestige. Exploring the social ecological drivers of regional biodiversity in cities. Now, I will note, for those of y'all that are not pop culture reference gurus, I have quite a bit of those, right? And I do so on purpose. I do so on purpose because it allows you to create cognitive links between what you know and maybe what's not so known right, in order to better center that knowledge. Today is not going to be any different, but first, before we do that, I think it's important to start with a premise, okay? The premise being that social inequality is an ecological issue. If we understand it as such, then we can start to see how injustices shape both the social and the natural landscapes that we work in. Now, Here's a pop culture reference, number one, right? Iron Man number two, Age of Ultron. How many of y'all seen that movie? Raise your hands. Okay, if you haven't seen it, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm going to explain why it's relevant to this talk. Okay, one of the lines in that movie, Tony Stark just guns blazing, thinking he could do everything. He just told everybody he's Iron Man, right? So he's thinking he's hot, you know what. And he tells the Avengers, I want to create... Uh, a body of armor, a suit of armor around the world to protect everything and everyone. Little did we know that would lead to this. Yeah, James Bader, who is an excellent actor, but also <laughs> Ultron. Ultron, who would eventually tear down the world. You know, with a billionaire like Tony Stark, he certainly could have known that we already have a shield around the world. It's called the Ozone. But no, okay, cool. That's what. That's, that's fine. That's fine. Anyway, the idea that we somehow are reliant on the planet, right, that we are part of this planet, is something inherent, intrinsic to that line, right, wanting to be able to protect. Here's the thing. Quite a bit of the life that already exists, for instance, the ozone layer, is due to really small microscopic diatoms that create a bunch of oxygen in order to shield the planet. We already have a shield. 
if y'all didn't even know, we already have a shield through, say, influences of radiation that could easily kill us, right? But we have that ozone. So thinking about the ozone and thinking about other wildlife like coyotes and how they contribute to what would essentially be the biodiversity shield. We oftentimes think about green infrastructure and plants, right? We think about blue infrastructure and water. But what about living infrastructure? Like these little guys. Also, you will note, I do not hold back on the cute and cuddly. So you will see quite a bit of that because we're here for the charismatic megafauna, right? <laughs> so I oftentimes think about, again, the what's called the umwelt. The, the view, the lens, the perspective of the animals that I study, like these coyotes. And I'm going to take you all through a journey trying to understand from coyotes to ecosystems, how do these systems operate, right? How do they serve as our figurative shield or our armor? And I'll start with a story from my dissertation. So this coyote puppy that you see here on film is about seven, eight weeks old. This is at a captive coyote facility in Millville, Utah that is run by the USDA. And it's really insightful because it allows for researchers to do work on these animals to understand their behavior and their ecology, to work on how we can create more coexistence. This particular individual right here on camera, he was one of our favorites. We call him Kal-El for short. For those of you that are fans of Superman, you'll know Kal-El is the birth name of Clark Kent because dude was fearless, right? He's maybe about seven, eight feet away from me. That's really close. <laughs> that is really, really close for coyotes. But then eventually, I'm going to pan over to the rest of the family. And the rest of the family, including the parents, are like, you got this, cow, man. We're going to hang back here. You keep doing your thing. <laughs> We're going to stay right here. And for me, as a graduate student, I thought to myself, why on earth is this puppy bolder than the rest of his family? But then if you expand it, why? is this family, relative to the other coyotes, are considerably bolder. So that behavior you just saw of the parents and the puppies staying still watching, that's also a measure of boldness because some of the other puppies and parents and some of the other pens would constantly run back and forth. For those of you that have been to a zoo, for instance, you may have seen zoo animals that pace back and forth, right? That's a sign of stress and anxiety. So even this family, as shy as they seem, are relatively bold. Why is it that some families are bolder than others? Why is it that some populations are bolder than others, right? So starting at the individual level, we then start to expand outward. And here, here is where I have to have the obligatory Jeff Goldblum drop, right? I got, I got to, right? <laughs> Which, new Jurassic Park movie is coming out in the summer. This handsome Adonis is going to be back on film. <laughs> and if y'all remember the original Jurassic Park movie, what did Jeff Goldblum's character say? He said, life finds a way. Now, this was an allusion to certainly dinosaurs finding their way out of man-made enclosures that we thought were somehow going to be ironclad. We realized, yeah, velociraptors, they know how to open doors. We got it. But I liken this to urban ecology. Why? Because... Cities were previously thought to be inhospitable too. And here, life also is finding a way. So much so that we have examples, not just in the United States, but all over the globe. And I am positive that there are at least 75% of y'all that have an example of urban wildlife in your own backyard, right? I've heard, say for instance, many of the stories around coyotes and cats. We're gonna get into that. Or the stories around pigeons. Some of y'all think pigeons are just feathered rats, but they're incredibly smart and agile, right? As well as our study species for the lab, these mammalian carnivores. Great thing about doing carnivore work in cities, no matter what city you're in, everybody loves seeing them or loves to hate to see them. I don't know which one, but the point being is that these two videos were videos provided to us, to the lab, by community members where we were working. So for instance, this video over here of raccoons scaling, doing a little bit of their own parkour, right? Over this fence line. This fence line is right up against a parking area that has a park on one side and then an industrial complex on the other. And these raccoons could care less that people are seeing them at 12 o'clock in the middle of the day. The video over here 
on my left, y'all's right, is of one of coyote puppies. And these coyote puppies, you probably can guess it, you're taking a look at the video itself, you see some support beams, right? In Denver, Colorado, when we were doing some of our work there, right in the middle between 2013 to 2018, this video was snagged by a resident of a coyote pair that created a den underneath their house. Right? So these animals are finding ways to adapt and thrive that are just awe-inspiring to the point that we start making stories. If you start compiling all of the little stories together, they start to add up. Story number one. Have y'all heard about the one with the Quiznos, right? The coyote, coyote walks into a Quiznos bar? No? Okay, because that's what happened. In Chicago in 2007, in April 2007, a coyote walks into a Quiznos, then proceeds to get into the drink cooler, stays in the drink cooler for 45 minutes, and starts to fall asleep. There are people eating their sandwiches, and there are people that are making sandwiches. They stop, they leave their food there, they get out of the Quiznos, and they call animal care and control. They relocate the animal to a green space, but this isn't the only one. How about the one where the coyote hitched a ride on the metro in Portland? Or even closer, how about the coyote that, see so we have pizza wrap, we have coyote wrap, or, or coyote pizza or whatever, pizza coyote here too, <laughs> right? This was in Huntington Beach, where this coyote every other week was getting pizza from a local pizzeria. All three of these examples, and we could probably pull out one after the other after the other, I, because every once in a while, YouTube will hit me up and say, hey, we got a new coyote video for you. And I say, all right, cool, you know I'm gonna watch it. And there was one recently of a coyote that made it into somebody's house chasing a cat. <laughs> so it's remarkable how much you find, and all of these add up to one thing, conflict, right? Coyotes, as adaptable as they are, and as smart as they are, sometimes get so smart that they find themselves in really uncompromising situations. So this, right, this adaptable behavior paired with the way in which people interact with those organisms can ultimately lead to conflict. Everything from, say, vehicular collisions that certainly can lead to mortality for the animals, but also damage property, injure people, as well as soliciting food this particular photo that you see up here on the top right is of one of raccoons in Tacoma, Washington. If any of you have been to Tacoma, Washington, you'll go to this park called Point Defiance Park. And the animals, all of a sudden, there's one, then three, then five, then 12 that come out to beg for food. This particular photo is great because they're right up against a car from somebody who was trying to feed the animals. So the staff, at the zoo, Point Defiant Zoo and Aquarium, had to come and say, please don't do that, right? To, again, food subsidies and pets being taken. So it should be noted that in all of these examples, human beings are both the directors and the audience. I like to joke that we are the Lin-Manuel Miranda of this joint, okay? Not only did we compose all the songs, we casted all the cast members. We even put together the rotating stage. It's a Hamilton reference for all of y'all. I haven't seen Hamilton yet. <laughs> we also are seeing this as it unfolds. We also are acting in this play as it unfolds, right? Which is kind of antithetical to traditional ecology because traditional ecology narratives was all about us being separate from nature, that we always destroyed nature. And urban ecology is flipping that on its head. So then, I ask the question, and many urban ecologists do, and other people that don't study urban systems do, why cities, right? We're at a biodiversity symposium, and we're talking about cities? Why would we be talking about cities? There, there aren't that many, obviously y'all know this because you came to the talk, there aren't that many biodiverse native species here, why are we in cities? Well, let's give you a little bit of a quick history lesson, okay? Should be noted that urban ecology as it currently exists has only really existed for the last 20 to 30 years. Okay, urban ecology before the 1990s and the 1980s actually was more so the social science of understanding how people live and survive in cities. 
right? So how do human social structures interact with the built infrastructure? And a lot of social scientists at the University of Chicago painstakingly put together theories and ideas, hypotheses, and observations for the ways in which we grow our cities and we grow our societies. This would ultimately lead to the bedrock foundation of understanding what urban ecology can be. So UNESCO created this program in order to understand urban systems. Why? Well, in the 60s and the 70s, there was emerging data that came out linking carbon dioxide emissions to people. And many in the scientific community started to raise some red flags. There's an issue here. What's going on? So they created the Man and Biosphere Program that was dedicated to understanding how natural and cultural ecosystems were intertwined with each other. But unfortunately, it still took another couple of decades until two different social ecological programs were put together under the National Science Foundation. One being in Phoenix, Arizona, the other being in Baltimore, Maryland. Just to kind of speed us up into the future, we now have three, with the new one being in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Certainly San Diego could have made a case for their own, but NSF needs to give us more money, so there's that. So all of this is important because to kind of frame it in this climate crisis, the current resolution of urban ecology got the best alley-oop it could get from global climate change. This field and discipline is based solely off of many of the data that demonstrated that there is no place on Earth that is not touched by us, right? Put that together and how it doesn't jive with the previous notion that we as people are separate from the system. This is fundamentally radical. It's us saying that we not only are part of the system, but we are fundamentally changing that system, which has led to the proliferation of a ton of frameworks and syntheses papers, including one that we recently just put together called the socio-eco-evo dynamics, so how society feeds into the ecology, which feeds into the evolution of cities. You can also compare that to, say, for instance, how organismal biology by Jenny O'Yang and company take a look at how different characteristics of the city influence natural variation in populations. Now, we aren't gonna spend all of today talking about natural selection, but one of the things y'all need to know about evolution by natural selection is that primary 101 point, you need variation in a population for it to work, right? And that variation in cities is directly governed by people, whether directly or indirectly. So the environmental variation that exists in cities is very much something that is influencing the biology of our cities. So, should be noted, again, another pop culture reference drop. If y'all haven't seen What If and gone to the multiverse, I challenge you to do so, because we're gonna switch a little gears here, right? There have been movements in parallel. I talked to you a little bit about urban ecology and urban wildlife and how cool that is, right? Wildlife are finding their ways in cities, and yet people do live in cities. Most people live in cities and will continue to live in cities from now until the end of humanity. So it should be noted that there have been other scholarly movements that have been happening in kind. The rise of environmental justice scholarship is one that we're going to pull out today because the landscape in the city is not equal, right? So it should be noted that in the 70s and the 80s, Dolly Burwell, Reverend Leon White, and Reverend Ben Chavez, along with Robert Bullard, Bob Bullard, came together under the United Church of Christ's Commission for Racial Justice. And they organized specifically around issues of toxic waste dumping sites. So in North Carolina in particular, many of the toxic waste dumping sites were co-located to communities that were predominantly black and low income. And Chavez once wrote, that environmental racism is racial discrimination in environmental policy making, the enforcement of regulations and laws, the deliberate targeting of communities of color for toxic waste facilities, the official sanctioning of the life-threatening presence 
of poisons and pollutants in our communities, and the history of excluding people of color from leadership of the ecology movement. Now keep that in mind while we go into what these words eventually would lead into. So here are a couple of photos from Warren County, and specifically the Warren County landfill protest. Back to what we were talking about, right? Toxic waste sites being predominantly co-located with communities of color. So this all came to a head in 1982 that led to a lot of protest about how and when and who got to decide how waste was eradicated. This would ultimately build, right? This would swell into a delegates to the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit. That is a mouthful. And that happened in October of 1991. This particular photo and this event is very informative because it helped us build what we now know as the 17 founding environmental justice principles. Now, it should be noted, these were created in 1991 and I've highlighted for y'all three really important ones because, well, all of them are important, but these pertain quite a bit to the city and the conversation we're having today. So look at number one. Number one, affirmation of ecological unity and interdependence, free from destruction. The word interdependence right there centers the fact that we are part of the system and also not always the most important part of the system, right? We are here taking up space and we really don't need to take up that much space. Like we could, you know, care to give a little bit more. How about number 12? Establish urban and rural policies that clean up slash rebuild in balance with nature. Or number 16, education of present and future generations in social and environmental issues. Now, granted, I'm not gonna read all of these, right? Y'all certainly can go online and find all 17 principles, but it's important to pull these out because let's fast forward back to 2022. We're losing biodiversity all over the planet in leaps and bounds, which means that we need to figure out answers quick, fast, and in a hurry. Right? Dissolving silos between, say, environmental justice scholarship and eco-evolutionary research, now is the time. Now is the time to figure that out because nations and the globe have a lot of co-occurring calamities happening. We have the climate crisis, we have biodiversity loss, which also leads to the reduction of ecosystem services which leads to the reduction of those services for people, which will oftentimes lead to limiting resources that leads to a lot of human-human conflict. So biodiversity, again, is the shield, is the armor, right? We may not necessarily see it as such, but healthy ecosystems with greater biodiversity allow us to keep those services intact. So that way we keep ourselves intact. And to that point, I mean, Californians, pat yourselves on the back. We are leading this effort in figuring out how do we conserve lands in a way that is not super colonialistic? <laughs> how do we conserve lands where the lands we're conserving are also being organized, stewarded by the community, by the people, right? How do we do it in a way where everybody buys in? So this 30 by 30 initiative that is statewide is thinking about these issues in a very, very deep way. But before we do that, before we do that, I mean, I, I have to do Groot, right? I gotta do Groot. The only, the, the one thing y'all can fault me for, okay? I'll just call myself out right, right now. I didn't do baby Groot. That's the one, that's the one thing you could take away from this. Um, but that aside, what I want y'all to do, I want all of you guys to be the trees, okay? We're all gonna be Groot for a little bit. So we're gonna follow the trees in a couple of slides. I'm gonna show you a side-by-side -side comparison of two different neighborhoods that are no more than a mile from each other, right? And I want you to pay attention to where you see the green, all right? So I am Groot, we are Groot. Got it? Everybody good? You ready? All right, let's do it. Okay. The neighborhood you see on my right, your left, is of University Place. It's southwest of downtown Tacoma in Washington, okay? The neighborhood on my left, your right, is of Southeast Tacoma, 
again, southeast of the downtown region. Now, rhetorically, I'm going to ask you guys these questions, okay? If you're being groomed and you see these grainy photos, <laughs> if I were to ask you, all right, y'all, which of these two neighborhoods has more tree canopy cover or generally greater vegetation cover? Probably wouldn't flinch. Everybody's pointing to this one, right? Okay. Now, I want to I want to see this because normally when I when I ask this question, it's been on Zoom, but this is the first time we've been able to do it in person. So I want all y'all to point for my next question, okay? So if the next question was, all right, y'all got that one. That one was easy. If I ask you then, which of these two neighborhoods would you predict has a higher median household income? Which one would you point to? Yeah, visually seeing it, I wish y'all could have taken a photo. It's stunning. This intrinsic idea that wealth is positively correlated with green space and tree canopy cover, it has a name. It's called the luxury effect. This idea that species richness and biodiversity positively correlates with socioeconomic wealth. Now, mind you, we're going to start digging into that because it's not always true for every single city, but it should be noted, if this is the first time y'all have ever been hearing about the luxury effect, I've done you a solid. I just did a literature review. Here are all of the papers that take a look at the luxury effect. How cool is that, right? Even now, this is out, outdated. There have already been a couple other papers that have taken a look not only at species richness and biodiversity, but also taken a look at life history traits also have taken a look at evolutionary trajectories. And what they find is that in a bunch of different levels of biological organization, from primary producers, aka these plants, all the way up to tertiary consumers, wealth has a huge impact. Here's a kicker though, right? I've kind of buried the lead a little bit here, but all of these studies all share one thing in common. They only study one city. And I know y'all know this. Is San Diego San Francisco? No. Is San Diego uh, Ames, Iowa? No, right? So each city is structured differently due to its histories and the way in which it's built. So in order for us to truly understand if a luxury effect is operating in our cities, what we did, and we being here, the Urban Wildlife Information Network, this larger collective of wildlife researchers, camera trappers, urban practitioners, right, managers, all came together across multiple U.S. cities using these camera traps. And it's amazing what you get on camera when you just put a camera trap out into the urban wild. So we decided, hey, let's address the question at hand. If we were to combine our forces and look at a bunch of cities in the network, would we find evidence that a luxury effect is in fact occurring? So that's exactly what we did. We took out of the now 35 cities that are underneath this urban wildlife information network, we asked the question, how do wealth and urbanization, so generally impervious surface cover, building densities, human densities, all that good stuff, right? How does that affect wildlife across cities? So we observed on these urban to rural camera gradients across 20 US cities, got data from 2013 to 2019. Here are some of the sites that you're seeing. Seattle, Chicago, and Wilmington, Delaware. And then we were able to approximate what human footprint is, right, urbanization essentially, by looking at impervious surfaces. So think concrete, think asphalt, right? Pair that with building densities and vegetation cover. And then we run together a fancy statistical model, principal component analysis. Many of y'all probably have already run it before. So that way we can get urbanization. Then for our proxy for income, we use the cost of one bedroom apartment. Why? Because not every part of the city has single family housing. So how can we be more inclusive? Think about what is the general cost to rent in an area? And briefly, if you guys would like to ask me about it later, I am more than happy to explain. We used a Bayesian occupancy model, which essentially just is taking a probabilistic model to try and understand whether or not urbanization or luxury is more influential influencing what animals are where. 
okay? And, of course, cute and fuzzy, here are some of the great photos that we were able to snag. Everything from, say, black-tailed deer that you have up here to raccoons moving through an area, a coyote who, if you study coyotes long enough, even from still images, you can start to understand what behavior they're performing. So, for instance, this animal right here is looking directly at the lure that we put on the tree, and we'll put a lure on the tree in order to get them into what's called the cone of detection, right, where we can actually see the animals. Once they're there, this particular little man right here is pawing. So, look, his leg is bent a little bit. They do what's – and some of y'all, if you have dogs, you know what this looks like, right? When your dog gets a new toy and they start pawing at it like that, that's what he's doing. My personal favorite of all of these photos is this one up top, right? So here are some raccoons practicing their parkour. All right, so what did we find? Well, I'm going to probably give you all a lot of um, no-duh answers. You're going to be like, Chris, yeah, no, no duh, obviously, right? But species richness, so that's the number of species that we're able to detect and count in an area, varies across cities. So let me orient you to this figure, right? Here are the 20 cities that we observed. And each of these natural distribution curves essentially help us understand where the mean is for each population, graded against this correlation between species richness and a city's income gradient. So if the line for this normal distribution curve is to the right, right? For, for me, it's to the right, for y'all, to the left, right? If it's on that side of the graph, then that means that there's a positive relationship like we would expect, right? Inside of that city, yeah. The number of species we're able to count increases with socioeconomic wealth. But if it's on the other side, it's actually the opposite, right? So if it's on the other side, what we're saying here is that as wealth increases, biodiversity actually decreases. And what we see in some cities, sure, the ones up top, positive relationship, just like we expected. And for St. Louis, it's kind of actually not a surprise. If y'all have been to St. Louis, you'll know that it, it is hyper-segregated by class and race. In fact, we have some colleagues and researchers looking at raccoon populations across what's called the Del Mar Divide. There's literally one road, one major road that separates low-income from high-income communities, and those raccoons don't cross that road, right? That evidence from that one species backs this up, right? So St. Louis, Seattle, Jackson, Mississippi, Phoenix, Arizona, Rochester, all positive. But you start getting a little bit down into Georgia, metro LA area, Edmonton, it's not so much so clear anymore, right? So even though we thought, yeah, certainly, for a lot of species, this luxury effect does seem to persist. It doesn't persist for every city, which means that we're missing something. We, we're, we're missing something. And that makes a ton of sense because socioeconomic status is but one, one gradient. What about the other gradients that exist in the city? So that's exactly what this meta-analysis took a look at. Of all of the studies that I just showed you a couple of slides ago, Curious et al. did a meta-analysis. And in their meta-analysis, what they did was they separated studies by flora, so plants, and fauna. They also separated the studies by how dense the city was, dense or sparse. So think Manhattan, dense versus Los Angeles, sparse, as well as the land use consideration. So whether or not it was fully residential, mixed, or non-residential. And certainly for residential plant studies, the majority of those studies tend to find this positive effect. What we would expect, right? Increasing income, increasing plant diversity. But that's not always the case when you go to mixed neighborhoods that are a mix of residential and industrial. And it certainly isn't the case when you go all the way non-residential. Same thing can be said for the animals. So this is where we start to dig a little bit deeper and we start to dig into our past, right? What was past is present, leading to what's called the legacy effect. This idea that there are things that have happened in our past that influence our current reality. That one probably makes sense to a lot of y'all because if any of you are climate scientists in the room, you know that intrinsically. 
many of the ills that we are experiencing for the climate crisis today was carbon dioxide put into the atmosphere 30 years ago. So in order for us to better understand how we're going to serve biodiversity and protect it 30 years from now, what we do exactly today is going to influence it. To that point, let's talk a little bit about redlining. Hopefully, by now, from 2020 onward, there has been a lot of talk about redlining. But if you haven't heard about it, redlining was the government-sponsored program put together by the Homeowners Loan Corporation, or HOLC, in order to create these maps for about 200 plus cities that looked a little bit like this one, right? So here's a map of Oakland, and it's color-coded. And it's color-coded to determine who could live where. So it was state-sanctioned segregation, where in those blue and green areas, right, the green areas were A, the blue areas were B. They were normally reserved for wealthy white Americans. Whereas those yellow and red areas, C and D respectively, they were reserved for folks that were low income or communities of color. And from the 1930s to the 1960s, that was the law of the land in the city. Even if you had the economic mobility as a person of color to afford a home in those green or blue areas, there were de facto laws on the books that prevented you from doing so. Whether it was a denial of your bank loan for very spurious allegations, or you potentially had somebody trailing you. Maybe it was a cop, maybe it was a realtor who then reported to the officials. Say you passed all of that and you were still able to buy a home, you would have a cross burned on your front lawn. And in some of these cities, these blue and green areas were called sundown towns, which essentially means and denotes that if you were a person of color and you were caught in that neighborhood after sundown, you would be apprehended and lynched on site. Right? Now, what does this have to do with the ecology of our cities? Well, take a look at these maps. I've done you a solid here, the first being, if you haven't already done so, read The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein which gives a history of redlining. The second being this resource right here. Apologies that it's at the bottom of the screen, but it's the University of Richmond's Mapping Inequality Project. Why do I bring this up? Well, the text is pretty small, but here, this is map 61. This is map 108. I couldn't even fit all of the maps on this screen. And y'all see how big this screen is, right? Here are the cities where we do our research. Tacoma, San Francisco, Oakland, Seattle, hopefully San Diego if y'all have us, right? It's, it's not on this, this map if you're curious. But if you went here and you're geolocated based off of this website, it'll show you a map right now. And since everybody has a phone, I, I challenge you to go look at it right now. You'll see a map of what San Diego looks like, right? I, if I'm thinking through the umwelt of the coyote, I'm thinking about how I navigate this system. Why am I thinking about how I navigate these systems? Well, because being in an urban ecosystem is tough, y'all. I've, I've been playing it up, and don't get me wrong. I mean, urban ecology is great. It's the one ecological field where you can go do some data collection and then hang out at the brewery and then go do data collection again, okay? So let, let, me, not, let me not pick any bones about it, right? It's pretty, pretty dope. But... That being said, urban organisms, when they move through the city, they have a whole host of disturbances that they are faced with. Now, for those of you that are young enough to know what the Avatar Last Airbender is, that is the section of today. I'm speaking to y'all for that, okay? Why? Because the legacies of redlining impact human and environmental health, too. Not just housing. It's far beyond that. So, for instance... Greater air pollution is found in previously redlined areas today. That study was published in 2020, right? Urban heat islands, so how hot an area of the city gets, today is still hotter in those redlined areas. People that live in those areas have more frequent ER visits, 
higher rates of asthma, and higher rates of cancer. Also, urban tree canopy cover and landscape slash habitat characteristics are completely altered in those environments. So there are overall disparities in ecosystem services, not just who does and does not have a pretty park, but who does and does not have access to a healthy environment. In 2022, think about that, y'all. Here's some data, for instance, that demonstrate to that point in these graphs how looking over 37 of those 200 plus cities, that even today, tree canopy cover is greater in those green and blue areas for most of the cities than they are in those red and yellow areas. Redlining was abolished in the 1960s. That was more than 50 years ago and we're still seeing the signatures of that today. So that means the animals that are moving through the city are behaving by our legacies. They're responding to our past. I oftentimes think of it as being akin to the light of stars, right? Say if a star is 200 light years away, that means the light that we're seeing is 200 years old. That light is old. So in order for us to get ahead of this, we need to think about what our climate futures and environmental justice futures look like 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. Because if we don't solve this problem, biodiversity is done. And that's what led us to think about the interconnectedness of these systems, right? So structural racism and classism and all of the machinations within having projections to where the impervious surface cover is, which influences how hot certain areas get. Asphalt gets really hot. Y'all know this. If you were to go outside right now and just touch the asphalt, it will be hotter than any of the soil that's right next to it. I challenge y'all to do that after you get out of this, and I guarantee you it will be hotter, right? Green space and tree canopy cover is also variable according to where the impervious surface is, which influences the environmental pollutants, resource distribution, and yes, even disease dynamics, which we have a natural experiment happening right now with COVID, which influences the eco and evil processes therein. So in order for us to better even do our job better as better scientists, we need to understand how we sample better. This is at the foundation, the core of the way in which we do our jobs. So hopefully at this point, I've convinced you all that social inequality is an ecological issue. And then by that same token, environmental justice and anti-racism are perhaps the most potent forms of urban conservation that we have today. I would argue that they are in fact the bedrock of what we do. And if we see it as such, then we can start to think about how do we decolonize our efforts? How do we reconcile past ills? And how do we mobilize community members like y'all so we all collectively do the work, because we all got a part to play. Should be noted that I am giving the State of the Biodiversity Address for the symposium today, but I am not the first, nor will I be the last, to talk about this. That even access to a healthy environment was born out of the Civil Rights Movement, which is why this conversation is so important, because the more we wait, the less time we have and we need to act like yesterday. So, many folks that are conservationists will ask me, okay, Chris, well then what can we do? What should we do? And oftentimes my recommendations are not ecological in nature. They are more about the society that we live in. And you'll notice, because for California this is incredibly important, I'm up at Berkeley, I see it almost every single day, affordable housing. Y'all may be thinking, affordable housing, how is that connected to wildlife dynamics? Well, let me tell you a story about a coyote and a coyote's semi-owner. Okay, so we have, unfortunately, a substantial unhoused population in San Francisco. And many of the students that work in the lab, when they're setting up cameras, when they're doing fecal transects, they're talking to the people in the city, many of whom, again, are unhoused. 
And when they hear the stories of the people in the city, you know what stories they hear? They hear about the coyote that has a name, that's been fed by this person who's unhoused. And this person who's unhoused has taken ownership of making sure that the health of that coyote is tip-top shape. Now, normally, I would come on here and tell y'all as a daily PSA, don't feed wildlife. Don't feed wildlife, <laughs> right? And also, if that was the only approach we took and we didn't address affordable housing, I could tell y'all that till I'm blue in the face. It's not going to make a difference if nobody has a house to be in in order to be able to actually create the system that we want to see. So making sure people have housing, super important. Public transportation, same way. All of these issues, right, could be subsumed in what's called Maslow's hierarchy. If folks are unable to access their basic rights, then how can we ask them to protect biodiversity? If they can't protect themselves, do you think they care about a native species? <laughs> no. And I'm a biologist, y'all. I'm a biologist. I care about those species. I think they're cute as hell. I got into this job because of it. And I know that part of my job has to be talking about the connections. Everything down to voting and making sure that folks have the ability to vote. So that way disenfranchised voices have that platform. So for my concluding slides, I just want to provide y'all an aerial view, right, of the Bay Area. Take a deep look at it. We've done quite a bit to this landscape, so much so that it's really hard to not see it. Even when you are leagues above the planet, you'll still see our footprint. And our footprint is massive. It goes beyond just the great infrastructure that you see through here and through here, right? And yet, I'm hopeful. I am hopeful that we can leverage each other as the shield and the armor that we need. But that means that we have to deal with our past and our present and our future all at the same time, which is why I dropped the multiverse theory, right? Think about yourself in the past. Think about yourself now. And think about yourself where you're going to be. Try and envision that. I was a psychology major in undergrad, and we oftentimes had to do that quite a bit. Because it's really hard to think about what things are going to look like into the future, right? There's a lot of calamity, and yet, and yet, I'm hopeful. Why? Because through the eyes of my three- and six-year-old boys, they see nature even when others don't. So it is all around us, inside of us, and inside of our cities. We just need to see it. So with that, there are a bunch of folks I would like to acknowledge more than I can count. I want to acknowledge all of y'all and thank you for your time and listening to this talk. And I will open for any questions y'all may have.